Hello, this is the talk that I gave at the 2015 Jane Austen Society of North America Annual General Meeting in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm so pleased to be here and to speak to you all today about the juxtaposition of two of my personal research interests, Jane Austen's life in novels and the history of jewelry and gemstones. The session represents my investigation of the intermingling of the two, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share it with you. Jane Austen's letters portray a woman with a keen interest in the minutia of fashion and dress, including jewelry. Her May 1801 letter to Cassandra refers to the sisters' well-known jeweled possessions, their topaz crosses on gold chains, parent, presents from their sailor brother, second lieutenant Charles Austen, who had recently earned prize money in the capture of a French ship. Jane writes, He has received 30 pounds for his share of the privateer and expects 10 pounds more. But of what avail is it to take prizes if he lays out the produce and presents to his sisters? He has been buying to gold chains and topaz crosses for us. He must be well scolded. He will receive my yesterday's letter today, and I shall write again by this post to think and reproach him. We shall be unbearably fine. Jane's epistolary manner is jokingly stern as she feigns indignation in relaying her reaction to her brother's gifts promising to scold and reproach Charles, and belying the delight she must have felt over the fashionable topaz gems and the tiny crosses, made all the more precious coming from her successful brother, for whom she felt great pride. Jane's description of the sisters when they wear the necklaces as unbearably fine continues the jest by perhaps mockingly referring to the imagined overbearing pride and boastfulness with which they would wear the jewels, inciting the envy of their social circle. The phrase could also connote Jane's disapproval of over-ornamentation, or possibly allude to feelings similar to those of Fanny's, uh, Fanny in Mansfield Park for her brother William's gift of an amber cross. The acute awareness of the precious nature of the gifts from a beloved brother and the Austin sisters' immense gratitude for Charles' generosity and thoughtfulness. The imaginable permutations of the phrase unbearably fine are as multifaceted as the topaz crystals in the Austin sisters' crosses, implying Jane's understanding of the multitudinous significances of jewelry. Whether worn as the evidence of social superiority to create jealousy in others, jokingly or not, or as a symbol of a brother's love, jewels have social import. Regency women wore jewelry as a signifier of nobility or gentility, and because sumptuary laws were more custom uh, than legal reality, luxury items like jewels were also evidence of conspicuous consumption or the acquisition and use of things for the purpose of displaying to others your wealth, power, and status by the nouveau riche. Hence, jewelry, a source of visual pleasure and aesthetic delight, became another emblem of the competition for higher rungs on the social ladder of Regency England, and in Jane Austen's novels of manners, the author uses jewelry as another means to expose characters' vices and virtues, and quite possibly the broader socio-political and even global implications of these tiny jewels. In this presentation, I will guide you through a selective history of jewelry styles during Jane's lifetime, from her birth prior to the French Revolution to the early 19th century and the Regency period in England, and will explore the microcosm of jewels in Jane's novels within the macrocosm that was her world. At the time of Jane Austen's birth in 1775, opulent sets of matching jewelry dripping with precious gems were very popular among aristocrats in England and the continent, at least until the French Revolution. Faceted gems sparkled in candlelight at evening social gatherings, reflecting not only light but also the wealth and status of the wearer. Venetian lapidary Vincenzo Peruzzi invented the brilliant cut for diamonds in 1700, and this quickly replaced older cuts like the rose because it enabled gem cutters to maximize the diamond's dispersion of light into its spectral colors. This prismatic effect, commonly called fire, made diamonds and their imitations the dominant jewels. Also popular in the late 18th century were chatelaines and shoe buckles. 
Chatelaines could be hooked to a belt and included a, a hanging set of personal accessories like a watch or scissors. The chatelaine in this image on the right includes jasper ware or ceramic plaques. Shoe buckles like these made of glass paste and base metal were at their largest and most popular during the decade in which Jane was born. Both of these items went out of style with the French Revolution. The versions here are made with imitation materials and therefore were more likely to survive to the present. Examples made with natural gems were not only more expensive, but as time passed and taste changed, were also more likely to be broken up so the gems could be used in more fashionable jewelry. Here are a few survivors of the recycling of jewelry. While diamond, emerald, ruby, and sapphire reign supreme, both in desirability as in price like they do today, other gems considered semi-precious were also popular. These included smoky quartz, amethyst, garnet, river pearls from England, moss agate, carnelian, amber, malachite, moonstone, carbuncle or unfaceted garnet, and turquoise. The gemstone trade was truly globalized with European and Asian as well as New World sources. In fact, the discovery of gem sources in South America, particularly Brazil, mitigated the near exhaustion of Indian diamonds, Siberian amethysts, and German topaz, among other gems. The sumptuous excess of Louis XV's gem-encrusted reign included jewelry containing precious stones of various sizes, shapes, and colors in voluptuous floral and foliate designs, like those on this slide. In both examples, the gems are predominant, while the metal foundation is subtle or hidden by the plethora of stones. Such a multitude of gems might seem excessive to those unable to afford enough food, much less a dazzling piece of jewelry. Such was the case with the diamond necklace affair in Paris leading up to the French Revolution. This diamond festoon necklace seen here in an engraving of the design and in a replica, is a collar style with loops and pendants hanging down and an incredible number of faceted diamonds, 647 brilliant cut stones weighing in at 2,800 carats or 1.2 pounds. The opulence of the necklace was emblematic of the privilege of the elite and the devastatingly unfair distribution of wealth in France. The scandal and ensuing court cases surrounding it helped set the stage for the overthrow of the French monarchy less than a decade later. It is considered one of the most notorious public scandals in history. As the story goes, the necklace was originally commissioned by Louis XV for his mistress, Madame de Berry, but he died before it was completed. The jeweler was frantic for a buyer and approached the new king, Louis XVI, but he professed to be unable to afford it. The jeweler, Charles Balmer, enlisted the help of a scheming courtier, the Countess de la Motte, and a cardinal anxious for the queen's favor to tempt Marie Antoinette to buy the necklace. Lamotte tricked both the cardinal and the jeweler, obtaining the necklace under the auspices of selling it to the queen, and sent it off to Europe to be dismantled and sold. The ensuing trials cleared the cardinal of wrongdoing, branded Lamotte a thief, and left Marie Antoinette's reputation and that of the royal family in tatters. For the first time, the French monarchy was dressed down publicly and officially by the courts and nobility, paving the way for the revolution to come. Like the monarchy that supported it, the extravagant mode of ornamentation exemplified by the diamond necklace was eventually abandoned for jewelry with greater simplicity and symmetry and composition, the neoclassical style. The transition was a period of great evolution and development with rapid changes in what was considered fashionable or safe. During the reign of terror in France, possession of gem studded jewelry was associated with the aristocracy and therefore a possible trial or not an execution by guillotine. The jewelry of France's previously elite was broken up and sold to fuel the new republic, flooding the market with French diamonds and making the previous opulence politically incorrect at best. This led to recycling of natural gems, with older pieces of jewelry dismantled and remade in the more restrained styles, with notably fewer gemstones per square inch, reflecting the attitude of the new government. The transition of jewelry styles paralleled the changes in the socio-political landscape in France and abroad. A French case in point is the pair of guillotine earrings from Paris, manufactured during the Reign of Terror in the image on the right. 
In the image on the left, you can see a class, classically themed bust in a cast glass cabochon, marking the upsurge of another classical revival, and this time with significant focus on Greco-Roman imagery in miniature. The juxtaposition of the violence inherent in an instrument of execution and the serene, logical Romanesque faces is striking and emblematic of the shockingly swift changes of the period. Following the French Revolution, in the words of jewelry historian Ernie Bradford, there was a, quote, deliberate austerity and paucity of jewelry display, and, as always, the arts of luxury were the first to suffer at the hands of equality, unquote. Even in the midst of a revolution and, la and the later Napoleonic Wars, France maintained its influence on dress and jewelry fashions. A new France warranted new dress styles, fashions that bucked the trends of the lavish old court. The simpler dresses and pseudo-Greek styles, like that worn here by Queen Louise of Prussia, required simpler or no jewelry. The burgeoning middle class also demanded cheaper alternatives, including semi-precious gemstones and imitations. Although England did not experience such an escalation of violence and mass executions on British soil, the diamond necklace affair, the deterioration of the French monarchy, the execution of Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette, the reign of terror, and the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte all captivated the English and eventually led them into war. Jane Austen's England was also not immune to the changes in jewelry styles, and in fact exerted some of their own influence through the manufacture of popular materials. In imitation of the very popular hardstone cameos found in Roman archaeological sites, Josiah Wedgwood perfected the production of jasperware ceramic plaques with classical images that could be used in brooches, tiaris, tiaras, necklaces, belt buckles, bracelets, and more. The most successful Wedgwood plaques were those in cut steel frames and settings produced by Matthew Bolton in Birmingham, England. Jewelry made of cut steel became popular in the late 18th century and remained fashionable for the next 100 years. Its effect is similar to that of marcasite or iron sulfide, a fastable metallic mineral originally used to simulate diamond in Switzerland, England, and France, but then became popular in its own right. Cut steel, in essence, could Im simulate the imitation. The fastened steel studs were riveted in place, and the finished jewelry was wildly popular on the European continent, fostering Anglomania, or the popularity of all things English. Wedgwood and faceted steel items were in demand throughout Jane's lifetime, even in court, because of their quality, versatility, and the owner's pride in their English manufacture. In the image on the right are belt buckles and buttons, circa 1810, and the image on the left is a belt clasp from 1800. Cameos based on classical themes are the quintessential neoclassical jewels and were immensely popular in the early 19th century. In this portrait of Napoleon Bonaparte's sister, Pauline, her jewelry ensemble includes antique cameos prized by the emperor and his family. Her cameos exhibit the geometric precision, elegance, and symmetry of Greco-Roman architecture. Viewing the portrait becomes a game of counting cameos. How many do you see? How many do you think she is wearing? I'll give you a second to count. The original antique cameos discovered in ancient archaeological sites like Pompeii were frequently carved hardstone or agates harder than glass that contain alternating light and dark layers. Sardonyx is the general name given to these agates that exhibit red and white layers, while onyx is black and white banded quartz. Other colors include shades of orange and brown. Carving into these layers produces a striking contrast between the foreground and the background of the images, simulated in blue and white by the Wedgwood Jasperware we saw earlier. Other imitation materials include cast glass, different colored glass pastes, enamels, and shell, as in the image in the upper right. The upper middle image is a cameo ring carved in onyx 
but it is not an original antique from ancient Rome. Instead, it is a carving of the Dauphine and Marie Antoinette, circa 1790. Before the French and Industrial Revolutions, jewelry directly depicted social rank, but with the political upheaval and the advent of mass production of imitation jewelry, the aristocracy was forced, or alternately delighted, to adopt the styles and materials of the increasingly powerful middle class. Members of this rising social stratum had a strong desire to visibly emulate their social or at least fiscal betters through the display of the trimmings of wealth. Beyond imitation cameos, the proliferation of glass paste gems answered this craving with counterfeit diamonds, emeralds, rubies, topazes, aventurine, and even opals. The paste formed a hard leaded glass with optical properties similar to many gems. It could be faceted, usually with rows or other simple cuts, and backed with foil to change or enhance the color. Faceting made the imitation gems glitter in the candlelight, just like the authentic gemstones they were manufactured to mimic. Opal, which has, was not yet readily available from Australia and therefore extremely rare, could be recreated using a milky blue glass over rose-colored foil. The image on the right is of the older, pre-revolution style with glass paste opals and diamonds. The image on the left is a pendant with authentic gold, pearls, and hair, but with green glass paste to imitate emeralds. Sometimes these imitations, particularly the glass paste, were so sophisticated that non-jewelers and non-lapidaries could not tell the difference, making them appropriate for use by the aristocracy and wannabe aristocrats or social climbers. Social climbers abound in Jane Austen's novels, some more notorious than others. In Northanger Abbey, Jane's parody of the Gothic novel, Isabella Thorpe receives word that her marriage to James Moreland has been approved by his father and immediately envisions herself with all the accoutrements of a very wealthy woman. Her desire for a brilliant exhibition of hoop rings illuminates her motivations for marriage as monetary and material rather than for love. There is not even a balance between the two. Her future husband James does not explicitly play a part in her married daydream and she is certainly not imagining the plain wedding band that would semiotically convey her married status, but rather the gem-encrusted hoop rings that were so popular among the very wealthy. Hoop ring is a general expression for rings, including plain gold wedding bands, as well as rings set with stones in a line along the band. The adjective brilliant, along with the plural rings, indicate the latter, examples of which you can see in this slide. The image on your left contains examples in England's royal collection, owned by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. As you can see, the rings include mostly monochromatic and linear arrangements of gems, but there are a few with some color variety. The two images on your right are acrostic hoop rings, acrostic meaning gems arranged to form a message given the first letters of the names of the individual gemstones. In both examples, we have ruby, emerald, garnet, amethyst, ruby, and diamond, which spell out regard. Another example would be lapis, opal, vermeil, and emerald to spell out love. Vermeil is another name for hessonite garnet, which is often golden or brilliant orange in color. As you're probably gathering, many of these rings are given as love tokens, the unbroken circle of the band importing mutual commitment and eternal regard. Perhaps then, we should give Isabella the benefit of the doubt and assume she was imagining her husband's love for her in the form of sentimental jewelry rather than fantasizing how her possessions would make her superior to her acquaintances. Or perhaps not. Acrostic rings were also given to commemorate events, and some scholars believe that the trend began in pre-revolutionary France, or possibly when Napoleon gave his sister a bracelet of semi-precious stones, of which the initials formed a motto to celebrate the birth of her daughter. In her book, Jewelry in Britain, Diane Scarsbrick notes that this new style of the Georgian era, emphasizing width rather than length, meant that more than one ring could be worn on the finger, and hoops enameled or set with stones or pearls around half the entire circumference were very popular. In the close-up of this 1816 painting of a French viscountess, 
you can indeed see multiple rings on her individual fingers the rings along with her sumptuous clothing and implied financial resources to commission a painting connote the viscountess's aristocratic status The same is true for English aristocrats. This is a portrait of Princess Sophia, the daughter of George III and sister to Prince, the Prince of Wales. The close-up of her hand reveals luxurious rings of precious metal and stones to match her splendid clothing and setting. In this portrait, the Duchess of Devonshire displays jewelry only on her fingers, but she makes a count. As you can see, she wears at least one ring on each finger, and we can easily imagine her other hand, hidden from view, as equally decorated. How many can you count? In view of these portraits, more was clearly better, and we can readily envision Isabella in her own fantasy, and the brilliance of her fingers bejeweled in hoop rings. Isabella's true desire is to gain social status through marriage, and the power to instill envy and admiration in others, therefore aligning her with the amiable French rather than the more amiable English. The French, as perceived by many in England at the time of the French Revolution and subsequent Napoleonic Wars, used artifice to gain their egocentric desires, while the English were amiable and pursued goals more aligned with the common good. Isabella, subversive and selfish, and thinking of her hoop rings and their effect on others instead of James' feelings, is characterized by her mercenary obsession for material possessions and social recognition. Unlike the love matches of Austin's heroines, Marriage for Isabella is purely a business transaction, and her potential hoop rings are an economic commodity that carries political as well as economic significance, because they would enable her to bodily convey her status as married and moneyed and prompt approval and jealousy in others. Isabella professes to love James Moreland, but her thoughts about jewelry reveal that she sees him primarily as a means to gain socioeconomic status and influence, as the wife of a man wealthy enough to buy her jewelry. In, a, in fact, she sets her sights on a higher prize, the captain, uh, the handsome Captain Tilney, soon after being disappointed in James's future income. Isabella only got the chance to imagine influencing the opinions of, of members of her social circle with her display of jewelry, but Lydia, in Pride and Prejudice, explicitly uses her wedding ring to get reactions out of her family members and Hertfordshire neighbors. She returns to Longbourn as Mrs. Wickham, completely unabashed over the socially perilous manner in which she absconded with him from Brighton and cohabitated with him in London before Darcy financially encouraged her to marry her, him to marry her. Elizabeth blushes at her sister's impudence and feels compelled to leave the room when Lydia regales her family with an anecdote about displaying her wedding ring to a neighbor in this quote. Lydia is anxious for William Goulding, and everyone else, to appreciate and acknowledge that she is married, and uses her ring to mark her person as such because she craves the congratulations and approbation attendant upon newlyweds. Her story, an obvious gesture of boastfulness, highlights her ring as a gateway to the socially gratifying reactions to a bride and groom. But within her own family, only her equally ill-mannered mother obliges her with praise and adoration. Her sister Elizabeth finds Lydia's self-importance unbearable and flees the room, but Lydia takes pleasure in her mother's approval, particularly because she is the youngest of five daughters, but now takes precedence over her siblings as the only one married, the only one with a wedding ring. In her unrefined way, Lydia singles herself out for special attention by showing off her wedding ring to neighbors, family, and even the servants. Mrs. Elton attempts a similar maneuver for attention in Jane Austen's Emma when she experiences a lull in notice from Jane Fairfax and other attendees of the Highbury Ball. She flippantly remarks to Jane after trying to extract compliments on other elements of her apparel, quote, nobody can think less of dress in general than I do and I see very few pearls in the room except mine. Mrs. Elton makes her plentiful per plain her plentiful pearls, implying her superiority in fashion and therefore social rank, especially with respect to Jane Fairfax. In this sense, Mrs. Elton's prosperity becomes an embarrassment of riches in a society in which one should reveal one's affluence only indirectly and not be vulgar or too loud, too explicit about the possession of wealth. 
In other words, by talking about her possessions, she talks about her money, a social flub that transcribes her as tasteless rather than her desired effect of superiority. The text reveals no other details about the pearls, but these organic gems were worn in every possible item of jewelry. They were most common in earrings and necklaces, which limited the potential for damage, but pearl bracelets and even rings like the ones you see here were also prevalent. Empress Josephine Bonaparte is adorned with emeralds, diamonds, and pearls in this 1803 portrait, signifying the comeback of luxurious gems after the fallout of the French Revolution. Given Mrs. Elton's excessive personality, excessive talk, and apparent excess of resources, readers might imagine her adorned with all of the above, including a tiara, like the Queen, or the Empress of the Ball, as she feels she deserves to be. In reality, her middle-class pecuniary strength relegated her to perhaps pearl earrings and a necklace. Hair jewelry, another extremely popular and very English 19th century variety of adornment, makes a character illuminating appearance and sense and sensibility. Kristen Miller's on 2011 Persuasions article entitled Tokens of Imperfect Affection explores the use of both hair work and portrait miniatures to expose the deficiencies of relationships in Jane Austen's first published novel. Even more so than other forms of jewelry, hair jewelry connoted personal relationships because, as Zahn states, hair is, quote, a bodily substance that does not decay, and therefore it can be an enduring relic of a person, unquote. Hair symbolizes immortality, love everlasting, and intimacy as part of the body, and was most often incorporated into gifts of love or memory. In the quote you can read here, Edward asserts that the ring, uh, the hair in his ring, first noticed by Marianne, is his sister Fanny's, and the Dashwood sisters misperceive it as Eleanor's. Eleanor believes it is flattering proof of Edward's regard for her, but it is in fact evidence of his secret engagement to Miss Lucy Steele. Once Lucy reveals herself to Eleanor in a conniving manner, as the owner of the hair in Edward's ring, and thus the owner of his affections, Miss Dashwood sees the ring as evidence of Lucy's truthfulness because of the social customs surrounding the giving and receiving of hair jewelry. In, early 19th, in the early 19th century, as a rule, a young and unmarried woman could not receive hair jewelry from anyone other than female friends and family, male family, or her betrothed. Most often manufactured without initials or other identifying markers, the anonymity of love tokens allowed Edward to lie to the Dashwood sisters to save face and avoid telling the woman he loved that he was already engaged. In the words of Gillian Height Stevenson, hair was, quote, what her culture considered to be a symbol of woman's essence, unquote. Eleanor knew she was not engaged to Edward when she first saw the ring, but chose not to be offended at the thought of him clandestinely obtaining her hair or part of her essence without her knowledge. Lucy Steele was able to best her rival by staking her prior claim to Edward's promise of matrimony with the ring as evidence of their betrothal, thereby using it as an emotional weapon of source, sorts. Eleanor's knowledge of the hair ring was then insufferable because it was symbolic of Lucy and Edward's engagement, although she did have grave doubts about the authenticity, authenticity of Lucy's affection for Edward and vice versa. And Marianne did not diverge from the social norm when she bestowed a lock of her hair to Willoughby upon his earnest supplication. It was acceptable as long as he refrained from having it worked into jewelry. As Zahn writes, the hair ring and Marianne's lock of hair serve as a series of false signs, broken promises, and imperfect relationships. Hair is a powerful medium of memory both of lovers in the next county over, and of lost loved ones. In this slide, you can see two Austenian examples of the very English tradition of memorial jewelry, including a brooch containing Jane Austen's hair and one containing her father's. It was common in the middle and upper classes to include instructions and wills for making hair jewelry, specifying what form and for whom. These simple brooches help preserve the hair but do not prevent color loss, as you can see. Jane's original hair color was a bit darker. The items containing her hair are on display at the Jane Austen House Museum and truly are relics. Many Janeites visit the museum or wish to do so and be in the presence of these former pieces of the author we've come to Louisville this week to venerate.
Here are some more elaborate and expensive examples. The ring on the left was manufactured in England and contains dark hair with gold and pearls surrounding it. The ring on the right originated in Germany and contains elaborately looped hair with the words meaning precious remains. Both of the rings contain enamel to better protect and preserve the hair. Gifts in the form of hair and other jewelry were given, cherished, and appreciated within Jane Austen's affectionate family. Jane received her gemstone cross from her brother, and she writes the experience of Fanny Price to mirror her own, at least in part. Fanny frets over wearing her treasured amber cross from William with just a simple ribbon, exhibiting a fussiness that most likely incites much eye-rolling among members of the anti-Fanny camp. Fanny's conscientiousness is only exacerbated when she is given a gold chain from Miss Crawford, originally given to her by Mr. Crawford. The pro-Fanny readers of Mansfield Park might read her worry as an acute awareness of the social rules and principles, in contrast to the Crawfords' more relaxed morality. Lucky for Jane and Cassandra, Charles Austin included gold chains with the topaz crosses for his sisters, so they did not have to walk that social tightrope. Either way, Jane conveys her witty appreciation of her brother's gift in, his, in her letter to his, her sister, and Fanny's anxious gratitude for William's generosity in this quote from Mansfield Park. Fanny's amber cross may very well have been amber-colored topaz. Both were available during the Georgian and Regency periods, although topaz was arguably more popular and certainly more durable. Like Fanny's ethical principles, amber is not usually faceted because it is so soft, making it difficult to main maintain facet edges and corners like in Jane Austen uh, and her sister's crosses. Topaz is frequently described as having an amber color, particularly imperial topaz, from new sources in Brazil, like the Auro Preto Mine in Minas Gerais. The crosses have maintained their color well, despite being exposed to light in a museum setting, leading the gemologist in me to speculate that the stones do originate from South America. In addition, topaz was relatively rare and expensive before deposits were discovered in Brazil in the 18th century, at which point stones flooded the market, decreased in price, and became trendier with the middle classes. This might be why Charles Austin, a member of the working middle class, was able to afford the crosses. Also on display at the Jane Austen's House Museum is Jane's simple turquoise and gold ring. Like amber, turquoise is soft, but it was quite fashionable among the elites and middle classes. It is unclear how Jane came to own the ring, but it was probably a gift and would have been affordable at the time. The turquoise has pure blue color and is shaped into a high dome cabochon, like much of the Persian blue turquoise from what is now Iran. The ring remained in Jane's family for over 200 years before it made headlines when it was put up for auction in 2012, and the American singer Ke Kelly Clarkson made the winning bid for over $230,000. This is an enormous sum of sum for a bit of gold and turquoise, and is therefore a tribute to Jane Austen's modern popularity. The United Kingdom's export ban on items of historical significance allowed time for the Jane Austen's House Museum to raise money to meet Clarkson's winning bid and keep the ring in its home country. The Bring the Ring Home campaign was a success. Although, who can blame Kelly Clarkson for wanting to own a jewel once possessed by our dear Jane, at least in hindsight? Thankfully, Miss Clarkson graciously acquiesced to the export ban and the overwhelming effort to keep the ring in England and available for visitors, visitors to see. Throughout this presentation of jewelry styles during Jane Austen's lifetime, I have glanced at the jewelry in her novels and the secrets they reveal about her characters. Isabella Thorpe values the wealth that marriage can bring over love. The vulgar Mrs. Elton talks too much about her pearls. Lydia Wickham unabashedly uses her wedding ring to emphasize her superior status within her family, while the mercenary Lucy Steele brandishes the existence of Edward's hair ring as a weapon against Eleanor. Fanny Price cherishes her brother and either worries too much about social appearances or is more principled in her social actions than other members of her social, social, blah, blah, social circle. But what does Jane Austen's jewelry reveal about her? The authentic gemstones are small and less expensive, yet high quality in their purity of color and clarity. 
The topaz, turquoise, and glass beads in her woven bracelet connote her membership to the middle class and appreciation for fashion. The clean lines and symmetry, the rational and tasteful designs, are aligned with neoclassical styles of her time period. Any deeper meaning we find in these jewels regarding her character is a reflection of our individual genes. The Austens we construct for ourselves as we read her novels and letters, reach her, research her historical context, and gather at Jasna events to learn more. I look at Jane Austen's jewelry and see elegance, simplicity, and gemstones from around the world paralleling the global scope of Jane Austen's modern influence and appeal. What do you see? Thank you.